strategically appropriate services in health and healthcare, a tool for tribal communities. We welcome everybody and we're very glad you could join us today. Um, this uh, webinar um, is uh, sponsored by uh, SAMHSA and uh, we have a quick disclaimer slide that we'd like you to review about the views expressed in the webinar. Um, you can kind of read that slide yourself. Um, and then we also want to um, pro provide acknowledgement um, to SAMHSA and to Tribal Tech. Um, our two points of contact are Lori King from Tribal Tech and Gloria Guillory from Kaufman and Associates. And our contracting officer representatives are Maureen Madison and Marion Pierce. So uh, moving on to the next slide, um, I would like to um, introduce our wonderful speakers to talk to us about these tools for the Cultural Linguistic Appropriate Services Standards. Our first presenter is Darcy Graves. Um, she is a Senior Health Education and Policy Specialist, Health Disparities Practice with SRA International, um, and she's uh, a wealth of knowledge about these standards working in uh, a number of states across the nation. Uh, we also have our Tribal Training and Technical Assistance um, Consultant, uh, Gary Newman. Um, he's Salish and he works all across Indian Country and has a great deal of experience with um, helping communities with these standards. And uh, we also are honored to have Esther Tenario um, from San Felipe Pueblo. Um, she's the Project Director of Health and Wellness Department and um, on the Systems of Care project that they have in our community. And she has graciously offered to share some of the work they're doing in their community on the class standards. Um, I'd also uh, like to acknowledge uh, our TTA director, Cipriano Lucario, and um, I'm going to introduce myself a little bit more. I'm Connie O'Mara, and I'm a tribal, I'm a TTA coordinator for the center here, um, and I'm a member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation. I work out of Albuquerque, and I try to help doing a lot of webinars and um, on-site trainings. And I'm going to go ahead and let Cipriano introduce himself, and then we'll move on to our presenters. Oh, thank you. Uh, hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us on on today's webinar uh, call. Uh, first off, I'd like to say thank you to our presenters and facilitators um, for, for their efforts in supporting uh, class standards uh, information dissemination out to Indian country. Uh, I am a proud member of the Diné Nation and uh, have the opportunity of supporting the Training and Technical Assistance Center alongside Carney O'Mara and the rest of our team, and we just want to say thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to come in together today and, and thinking about uh, prevention and, and wellness in our communities. Thank you, Connie. Thank you, Cipriano. Uh, before I move on to letting our presenters introduce themselves, I'm also going to um, let you know that you're able to uh, ask questions using the chat function, um, you know, as you're um, online. And uh, we will we'll get to those questions at a couple of points during the presentation and then have uh, we'll open up the line so you can actually ask questions out loud towards the end. We'll try to allow adequate time for that. So um, without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and have Darcy, Gary, and Esther in that order um, introduce themselves a little bit more and we can move on with our presentation. Thank you so much, Connie. Uh, as Connie said, my name is Darcy Graves and I serve as the Senior Health Education and Policy Specialist with the Health Determinants and Disparities Practice at SRA International. We are a part of the team that helps manage the Think Cultural Health Project for the, HA, the Department of Health and Human Services Office of Minority Health, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. And with that, I'll turn over to Gary. Hello, this is Gary Newman, and I'm in the beautiful state of Montana right now. I'm a member of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribe, and it's been an honor to be involved with the TTA Center and the efforts for the last uh, 20 years that have brought us to doing this important work. With that, I'll turn it over to Esther. Hello, Kwasi Hopa. My name is Esther Tenorio. I'm from the Pueblo of San Felipe Pueblo. I work within the Health and Wellness Department, and I'm in charge of the Systems of Care Hopa project for our community. We've been doing class standards here for a few years now, and we've worked through some kinks uh, we're not perfect, but we are really working on the standards and incorporating the standards in our health work. Thank you for having me on this call. Yes, well, thank you. Thank you both uh, so much. 
just to give you a little bit of an overview of the presentation, we will be talking about some of the fundamentals or the concepts that underpin the national standards for culturally and linguistically appropriate services in health and healthcare, or more commonly known as the national class standards. And then we will move into the standards themselves. And with the assistance of Esther and Gary, we'll be interspersing that discussion with some real life uh, examples of implementation in tribal communities. So uh, just a little bit of housekeeping uh, before I get to the, the meat of the presentation. The Health Determinants and Disparities Practice, which, we, with, which I am a part of at SRA International, uh, is we really conceive of ourselves as bringing culturally and linguistically appropriate services or class and equity to systems impacting health. We have over uh, 50 years of combined experience in the areas of class, health disparities, and health equity. And as I mentioned, one of our clients is the HHS Office of Minority Health. And their mission is to improve the health of racial and ethnic minority populations through the development of health policies and programs that aim to eliminate health disparities. The Office of the National Class Standards from the Office of Minority Health align with a broader HHS initiative, which is the HHS Action Plan to reduce racial and ethnic health disparities. This aims to promote health equity and address racial and ethnic health disparities across the country. It involves all of the agencies across HHS in a department-wide effort to reduce and eliminate disparities. In fact, a goal of the HHS Disparities Action Plan is to strengthen the nation's health and human services infrastructure and workforce. The enhancement of the national class standards is specified as a task under this goal. The enhancement initiative took place from 2010 to 2013, and I will discuss the results of that process with you in a few minutes. Just to be uh, to make to ensure that we are all on the the same page, so to speak, uh, when we talk about class, what do we mean? Class is the acronym for culturally and linguistically appropriate services. And we conceive of that as being defined as services that are respectful of and responsive to individual cultural health beliefs and practices, preferred languages, health literacy levels, and communication needs, and are employed by all members of an organization, regardless of its size, at every point of contact. It's important to note that every healthcare encounter or health encounter is a cross-cultural interaction. You can, should, should consider not only your client's culture or your patient's culture, but also your culture and the culture of your institution or organization. Keep this in mind as you seek to respond effectively to the health needs of diverse communities within your service area. Every point of contact may seem uh, very broad, but as we know, uh, clients, patients and our communities intersect with our, intersect and interact with our organizations at a variety of different points. Uh, this particular uh, diagram illustrates what it might look like if you are making a appointment as a, as a patient or a client seeking services. And so we know that the client's experience is much broader than one specific patient or provider interaction. Every healthcare encounter is a cross-cultural encounter, and communication challenges may not be related may be related to more than just language barriers, health literacy levels, dialects, hearing abilities, and other communications needs, which aren't necessarily apparent at first glance. Influence and interaction between a health professional and a client. It's important that when we think about culturally and linguistically appropriate services, we think about it. When, uh, you know, what is the initial point of contact with your client? How does your client or patient learn of your organization? How do they, how are they able to call or contact you to make an appointment? Is that system in and of itself culturally and linguistically appropriate? And as you see, we can go through and see, you know, if preparing for the visit frequently, our, our systems require a great deal of paperwork to be completed ahead of time. Is that paperwork and is the identification of and knowing about that paperwork culturally and linguistically appropriate? 
how do you enter and navigate your healthcare health or healthcare organization when you're waiting in the lobby? What does that reflect in terms of the community, in terms of who is welcome and who is being seen? Uh, is the signage, the wayfinding, uh, the multimedia, are all of those pieces easily understood to a variety of individuals? You know, and then also discussion and referrals, billing, the pharmacy, reminders and follow-up communication, as well as patient feedback. Uh, depending on what kind of organization or institution you belong to, there are different points of contact, and it's just important as, you, as we move through the national class standards to be thinking about all of those different points with which the public interacts or intersects with you, and making sure that all of those points are culturally and linguistically appropriate and not just uh, within the, the provider-patient interaction. The Office of Minority Health has developed this framework for operationalizing CLASS, and we call it the National CLASS Standards. The standards are an important tool for promoting and implementing culturally and linguistically appropriate services. The National CLASS Standards were first developed by the HHS Office of Minority Health in 2000. In 2010, the Office of Minority Health launched an initiative to update the standards, which we called the Enhancement Initiative, which incorporated public comment, a literature review, and ongoing consultations with an advisory committee comprised of 36 experts re representing a variety of disciplines and organizations. In April of 2013, we were very excited to release the, the enhanced national class standards at the White House. There are 15 standards, each of which is an action step that guides professionals and organizations in their implementation of culturally and linguistically appropriate services. Let's walk through some of the concepts that underpin the national class standards. In the when we talk about culture within the standards, it encompasses race, ethnicity, and linguistics, as well as geographical, religious, and spiritual, biological, and sociological characteristics. Culture is defined as the integrated pattern of thoughts, communications, actions, customs, beliefs, values, and institutions associated wholly or partially with racial, ethnic, or linguistic groups, as well as those characteristics I mentioned earlier. Culture is dynamic in nature, and individuals may identify with multiple cultures over the course of their lifetime. This definition attempts to reflect the complex nature of culture, as well as the various ways in which culture has been defined and studied across multiple disciplines. This definition of culture uh, includes gender, includes age, includes sexual orientation. It is a very broad definition. Um, and is, is, it attempts to be very inclusive, recognizing that we all come to uh, the table or, or we all just simply uh, as ourselves identify across many multiple cultural identities. We use the Venn diagram to, to illustrate this because we all carry with us a race and ethnicity uh, biological characteristics, linguistic characteristics, and some sort of religious, religion or spiritual, spirituality characteristics. So we all come to the table carrying these things, and we experience all these things through all of these lenses simultaneously. So we don't, we conceive of this as a holistic approach and not uh, something to necessarily just be teased apart. The definition of health that we use, so when we're talking about health and healthcare organizations, or talking about wellness and health, we're talking about uh, physical, mental, social, and spiritual well-being. And we believe that this definition of health reflects the fact that many aspects of health influences one's well-being overall. The national class standards are intended for health and healthcare organizations, and I would even extend it further to any kind of organization that can impact one's health. So this definition includes medicine, behavioral health, mental health, public health, social work, community health centers, emergency health centers, and many, many more. 
Because of this, when we talk about in the standards, um, when we talk about the audience, we talk about the health and healthcare organizations, which are any public or private institutions addressing individual or community health and well-being. The purpose of the national class standards or their intention is to advance health equity, improve quality, and help eliminate healthcare disparities. The standards establish a blueprint for health and healthcare organizations to implement and provide culturally and linguistically appropriate services. In health and healthcare, we tend to have a lot of jargon or we use terms like cultural competency or cultural and linguistic competency, but um, don't always know what that might look like. And the national class standards attempt to operationalize these in uh, some in concrete ways so that organizations have a, a roadmap or a blueprint for systematically integrating, uh, adopting, and uh, maintaining and sustaining standards or services which are culturally and linguistically appropriate. Before we segue into the national class standards themselves, I just wanted to take a moment and see if there were any questions. Uh, either via the, the chat box or on the phone. So uh, please let Sylvia know, or Sylvia, if we have any questions, please let me know. Thank you. If you would like to ask a question, press star 1. Remember to unmute your phone and record your name clearly when prompted. Please stand by for the first question. And Darcy, also this is Connie again, and I just wanted to let folks know that if you want to type a question in the Q&A box online um, as you're watching the webinar, you can do that, and we will definitely address your questions later if you prefer to do it that way. Thanks. Thank you, Connie. And there are no questions in the queue at this time. Okay. Then we'll, we'll go ahead. But please, if there are any, uh, any questions that come up, please use the Q&A box as uh, Connie indicated, and we'll uh, pause again at the end of the presentation that we can, so we can talk further. So the national class standards are comprised of 15 standards that inform and facilitate the implementation of culturally and linguistically appropriate services. This slide illustrates the organization of the standards. There is a principal standard, or standard number one, that serves as the framing for all of the other standards. The, rest, the remainder of the standards are structured into three overall themes, governance, leadership, and workforce, communication, and language assistance, and finally, engagement, continuous improvement, and accountability. The principal standard shown here frames the essential goal of all of the standards. Conceptually, if the other 14 standards are adopted, implemented, and maintained, then the principal standard will be achieved. Providing effective, equitable, understandable, and respectful quality care and services helps to create a safe and welcoming environment at every point of contact that fosters appreciation of the diversity of individuals and provides patient and family-centered care and ultimately can help improve the perceived access to care. It can help meet communication needs so that individuals understand the health care and services they are receiving, can participate effectively in their own care, and make informed decisions and hopefully it will help to eliminate discrimination and disparities. Governance, leadership, and workforce are, is the first theme within the standards. And this theme emphasizes that implementing class is the responsibility of the entire system that you work within or the entire organization. Implementing class really requires the investment, support, and training of all individuals within an organization. The impetus for implementing class can and often comes from the bottom up. However, an organization's leadership shapes the culture of an organization through its priorities, expectations, and the behavior that it models. Therefore, the impetus for implementing class should also come from the top down. The standards in this, 
in this theme teach us that implementing class at every point of contact is a critical way to improve quality of care and avoid uh, detrimental situations. Standard number two underscores that class must permeate every aspect of the organization, from the top down and from the bottom up. We know that leadership in large part determines whether the organization's culture will embody quality, safety, and class. Standard two is aimed to help organizations provide adequate resources to support and sustain class initiatives and model an appreciation and respect for diversity, inclusiveness, and all beliefs and practices. And I believe Esther has uh, some examples of how Standard 2 has been used uh, in your community. Yes, Darcy, thank you. In most tribal organizations, these standards are already set by its tribal government. Though these standards are not written, it is recommended that some tribal leader within the community be a part of the management team to inform the organization of these standards. Uh, many of these are incorporated into the traditional systems within tribal communities, so it is really important to get the permissions, but also to know who in tribal government or who in the leadership uh, roles could assist um, with programming. In San Felipe Pueblo, we have hired a cultural and linguistic competence coordinator who is a former war chief to inform projects working on or providing healthcare services. And some of these examples is that he informs us with the development of employee training that includes an introduction of the cultural and linguistic uh, standards to be implemented across all tribal programs. Then we also provide trainings on the side to subsidize or supplement uh, the projects where they're having problems with culture or linguistic appropriate service interpretation. So training is ongoing, but it's, in San Felipe it's been wonderful in that we have had the generosity of our tribal leadership to inform us, and a lot of it is done orally at the beginning of each new uh, year when our tribal administration changes. And in the Pueblo country, uh, most of the tribal administrations change annually. That's it, Darcy. Thank you, Esther. So that would take us to standard three, which is to recruit, promote, and support a culturally and linguistically diverse governance, leadership, and workforce that are responsive to the population in the service area. This uh, it help the organization create an environment in which culturally diverse individuals feel welcomed and valued and effuses multicultural perspectives into planning, design, and implementation of class. Standard number four has to do with educating and training the governance, leadership, and workforce uh, throughout an organization, and, and Esther just provided some great examples of, uh, that relate to the ongoing training uh, of, of workforce and staff staff members, and it really helps the organization to prepare and support a workforce that works well with diverse populations meeting their needs and expectations, and it helps to assess the project of staff in developing cultural, linguistic, and health literacy competency so, in turn, they can better serve their patients or clients. Communication and language assistance the second theme provides guidance on how to effectively meet patients' communication needs. That may include sign language, braille, oral interpretation, or written translation. The standards in this theme can help organizations comply with federal requirements, such as Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990, and other relevant federal, state, and local requirements to which they may need to adhere. Poor communication can have tragic consequences. Uh, there's one such example is the case of Willie Ramirez, uh, where the misinterpretation of a single word led to a potentially led to a case of potentially preventable quadriplegia. Willie was a Spanish-speaking 18-year-old, and one day he had stumbled into his girlfriend's home and told her that he was intoxicado, and then he collapsed. He was taken to the hospital in a comatose state. 
when the girlfriend and the mother repeated the term the non-Spanish speaking paramedics took it to mean intoxicated. The intended meaning in Cuban Spanish is actually nauseated. After more than 36 hours in the hospital being worked on for a drug overdose, Willie was reevaluated and given a diagnosis of intracerebral hemorrhage. An emergency operation followed. However, at this point, his hemorrhage had been bleeding for too long, and the brain damage left Willie a quadriplegic. The hospital ended up paying a $71 million malpractice settlement. And while we hope that these that the Willie Ramirez case is uh, is a tragic example, and hope, and we hope that it's uh, certainly one that is not uh, not repeated. But it just underscores the importance of making sure that communication and language assistance is in place. The standards within this theme include standard number five, which has to do with offering communication and language assistance. And this helps organizations make sure that individuals with limited English proficiency and or other communication needs have equitable access to health services and helps to improve patient safety and reduce medical errors related to miscommunications. And with that, I'll, I'll open it back up to, to Esther, who has another, um, has some additional insight to share. In our community of San Felipe, 87% uh, of our tribal members are fluent in our Karis language. So as we move with health education or health uh, communication services, it is um, our mission to ingrain in all of our procedures the, the importance of having language uh, inter interpretation services. Um, some of our examples is within our systems of care project, our staff are trained individuals, and most of them are tribal members who are capable of communicating effectively with clients and community members to get them the assistance they need. And the assistance is across all health programming, um, interpreting letters that they get from their hospitals or insurance or even to read labels for prescriptions. Uh, and we have hired individuals under our health system who are proficient with uh, medication management issues. So pairing these individuals with uh, Karis speaking providers. And we have recently um, trained and certified uh, 10 community support workers within San Felipe who provide this type of assistance for our behavioral health programming. And then also with evaluation and when we're trying to gather information, when we establish focus groups to conduct data collections, we have to incorporate special considerations and they must be built into the process where we ensure that the data and information collected has fidelity. So we are constantly and continually checking on our processes and in, the, in how we develop instruments or how we incorporate services to be effective across our community. That's it. Great. That, that's, that's a lot, Esther, so that's great. Uh, and I just wanted to acknowledge that we have had a, a question come in regarding the implementation of the national class standards, and I just wanted to let you know um, that we'll be talking uh, about that a little bit later on in the presentation and some uh, documents and, and uh, implementation guides that exist in, in those areas. Uh, standard number six has to do with informing individuals of the availability of language assistance services, which help organizations inform individuals with limited English proficiency in their preferred language that language services are readily available at no cost to them, and it helps to facilitate access to language services across the organization. It's always essential that uh, when these services uh, are available, that all staff members know how to access them, because if, they're, uh, if the staff doesn't know, then it uh, can also be, often be a disconnect in making sure that the patients and or clients uh, or community members are able to to access them. 
Um, Esther, I believe you had an example for this as well. Yes, I did, and I think I covered most of it in the previous question, but in okay. fact, those efforts have been ongoing with dissemination. We're working with nutritionists. We're working with various providers to make sure that when language assistance is needed, that they contact us or they contact someone within that particular program who has access to um, the CARES language interpretation services. But also, when we post our events, we have several marquees within the community. We're mindful of how we uh, present the, the messages and that we are very careful about enticing the community with the, with the types of information that we would choose to put on the marquees. As well as the brochures and flyers, they're written to accommodate the, with the tribal members in mind and to provide information that the tribal members would be used, that would find useful. So we do screenings of our brochures prior to putting them out there. And as much as possible, we've been using um, uh, resources such as Wordle, and, and we've uh, somehow articulated, you know, our Keras language by sounding it out, even though our Keras language is not written. And we have used those tools to help bring forth some of the messaging that we've been wanting to uh, provide to our tribal members. Also, the visuals that we have um, developed to convey messages, such as uh, PSAs and digital stories that are being created by our youth have bought us tremendous um, resources for our tribal members to engage uh, in health programming or to bring the clients and the tribal members on board so that they inform us with what is appropriate to give back to the community. And uh, it, one of the examples is that in December, uh, at a community meeting where we have had, uh, where we had 1,500 tribal members, we had uh, provided education to one of our uh, tribal youth leaders. And a PowerPoint presentation was created using data, diabetes uh, data within our region in New Mexico and in our county, Sandoval County, and in our Pueblo in particular, working with our primary providers within our clinic. And we were able to uh, develop a PowerPoint presentation along with a PSA uh, and we had we trained our youth to talk to their family members or community members, and what we got from um, this presentation was tremendous support to fight uh, type two diabetes in San Felipe. And out of that, we got pledges, we got people to sign up for services, and this is just one example using youth and families with language and visuals to bring forth messages whereby we engage and we bring community to the table to help us deal with some of the health disparities. That's it, Darcy. Fantastic, thank you so much. Uh, standard, that takes us to standard seven, which has to do with ensuring the competence of the individuals providing a language assistance. Um, to make sure that organizations provide accurate and effective communication with, between individuals and providers, as well as empowering individuals to negotiate and advocate for important services by effective and accurate communication with health and healthcare organizations. And I think some of the examples that uh, Esther just shared also um, really talk, uh, address the, the concepts put forth in, in, in standard eight and uh, I hope that someday we can all see the examples that Ezra was talking about in terms of the digital stories and the images that they've helped to create. Because standard eight has to do with providing easy to understand materials and signage that help the organization make sure that readers of other languages and individuals with various health literacy levels are able to understand and access care and services and enable all individuals to make informed decisions regarding their health and their care and services and service options. And as Esther indicated, just knowing about the services, making sure that the messages are inviting and that you want, that the patient or client or community member wants to engage, all of those things are so essential um, and often in require community input 
which uh, is an excellent segue to theme number three, which is engagement, continuous improvement, and accountability. This theme underscores the importance of establishing both individual and organizational responsibility for implementing class. Effective delivery of class demands actions across an organization. This theme focuses on the supports necessary for the adoption, implementation, and maintenance of culturally and linguistically appropriate policies and services, regardless of one's role within an organization or practice. All individuals are accountable for upholding the values and the intent of the national class standards. A study published in the Journal of Healthcare Management described a good example of a, health of a health organization using the principles of this theme to improve communication and care. A hospital had discovered that their Latino mothers were making frequent emergency department visits for their children's earaches because they did not understand how to take the, children, the child's temperature. The hospital's response was to develop kits that included a thermometer and easy to follow instructions. The CEO noted that instead of spending $400 an hour in the emergency department, we were able to give them a kit that cost $3. This was a good example of how a health system engaging with a particular community to seek ways to better serve that community and holding itself accountable to serve that community well according to its health and communication needs. The first standard within this theme is standard number nine, which has to do with infusing class throughout the organization's planning and operations. It will help organizations make class central to the organization's service, administrative, and supportive functions, and helps link class to other organizational activities, including policy, procedures, and decision makings related to outcomes accountability. What this really means is that it's not, necessary, it's not necessary to have a class policy and procedure handbook in and of itself, but rather to examine the organization's policy and procedure handbook and make sure that those policies and procedures are culturally and linguistically appropriate. Uh, when I used to teach uh, in a, a medical school uh, or in, and in higher education, I used to say that uh, this is a, that cultural, cultural competency or class isn't simply a uh, general education requirement so that you get to go history, check, math, check, class, check. But really we're talking about making sure that history is culturally and linguistically appropriate, that the math is culturally and linguistically appropriate, and it's truly infused throughout an organization um, at every point of contact, both internally and externally. Um, I believe that Esther has some uh, real-life examples for this standard as well. Uh, yes. In, uh, we have been working with our tribal leadership to uh, inform us relative to what would be appropriate to incorporate within program initiatives. And uh, we do have in our systems of care um, project, a tribal re resolution that encourages us to incorporate um, cultural and linguistic appropriate service standards. And uh, within, and because SOC um, is there to work on children's mental health issues, we have within our behavioral health policies and procedures included um, language to, that encourage us to, encourages all of our providers to have cultural and language competence. And so in our recruitment processes and in our, um, our what is it called, in our, um, when we train our staff in our tribal protocols and procedures, we must touch on language and cultural standards and what the expectations are. And those are reiterated by our tribal leadership every time we have a meeting. But uh, going further, we have developed memorandums of understanding and memorandums of agreements with schools, with tribal courts, and various projects across uh, our community to make sure that there is mindful considerations for cultural and language considerations across all of our programming in San Felipe Pueblo. And, you know, having tribal leadership direction and directives is really helpful when we're doing this. 
Okay. Thank you, Esther. Um, you know, and another important thing is to take into account what Standard 10 begins to address, which is the conducting of ongoing organizational assessments to help organizations assess performance and monitor progress in implementing the national class standards and the concepts um, embedded within, and to obtain uh, information about the organization and the people that it serves, which can be used to tailor and improve services across the board. And I believe, Esther, you had some uh, had a, a story or an example to attach to this as well? We do. Uh, with our intake assessments, uh, we have also adopted or adapted to include multi-ethnic identity measures. And, you know, we work closely with our evaluation teams out of the University of New Mexico, and they've helped us access some of these measures. So as we're moving with our work in children's mental health, you know, we do do uh, data collections in this area. And one thing interesting as we're working with our youth, we got some feedback on our natural helper program and our project venture program. These are um, uh, projects that are under our suicide prevention initiatives. In there, our youth, an our youth answered um, uh, questions such as their, they want to be more informed about our San Felipe culture, our San Felipe uh, standards, or they want to know what uh, spirituality means for them. So this measure helps us uh, look at some of the areas or develop some of the areas or lessons for them so that we can be able to do better training and give them access to the information that they're requesting. The other thing is that uh, monthly in our task force meetings, we talk about evaluation and we talk about CQI, you know, with quality improvement and how we uh, gear our instruments relative to our services to make sure that the information that we are providing or the services that we are providing is received in a friendly way and that we then give them, give our stakeholders or our clients feedback as to what, how they answer their questions or how they see our services so that, you know, we can do better for them. And just having this component in our projects with evaluation has really been invaluable going forward with, um, writing proposals or even to write our reports as, you know, reports are required for all funding pro projects funded by the federal agencies and even tribal to tribal government also. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and and some of uh, Esther's example dovetails nicely with, with this standard as well, which is aimed at collecting and maintaining the demographic data of the individuals who are being served so that you can accurately identify population groups within a service area and monitor individual needs, access, utilization, quality of care, and outcome patterns, which can also be of assistance uh, when uh, providing those reports to the federal government or applying for, for grants or, or funding sources um, from various organizations. Um, Standard 12 has to do with conducting assessments of community health assets and needs. Um, and I believe uh, that kind of dovetails with some of what Esther just said as well. Standard 12 helps to determine the service assets and the needs of the population in the service area or the needs assessment. It helps to identify all of the services that are currently available and not available to the populations in the service areas which some refer to as a resource inventory and a gaps analysis. It helps to determine what services to provide and how best to implement them based on the results of your community assessment. Um, Esther, did you have more that you would want to talk about in terms of this? Um, maybe just to mention that, you know, in our projects, we try to incorporate process evaluations on a regular basis to provide uh, to participants and feedback is used to shape subsequent activities and projects hosted by the community. So these process evaluations that are incorporated in our program is very valuable. And then most grants or federal projects come with uh, cross-site evaluation uh, technical assistance. And But 
you know, the ability to have local evaluation built into these funding agreements is really, really very helpful. Excellent. Thank you. Standard 13 has to do with partnering with the community to help organizations provide responsive and appropriate service delivery to that community and helps empower members of the community in becoming active participants in the health and health care process. Um, Gary wanted to specifically highlight some of the aspects of consulting with uh, tribal elders and uh, other, other key, key stakeholders. Uh, Gary, did you want to share? Sure. Thank you, Darcy. I think it's real important in um, bringing in consultants from other communities to help with this work. I think it's important to keep in mind that we want to bring in Native American consultants um, who are familiar with the customs and values and the beliefs um, of a Native American community. I think it helps instill trust between the community and the consultant. Um, a consultant who is familiar with the importance of preserving the heritage and culture and understanding how historical and generational trauma has played a role in destructive behaviors or a community or individual's need to perhaps self-medicate. Um, and also to keep in mind mentoring someone in the community to take over these roles. And using consultants, I think, that have a clear understanding of the communities they work in, it helps the population to, to, to be, feel that they're important and they're involved in the design of whatever it is you're doing. And it, it also helps ensure that what you're doing is responsive to that particular community's uh, need. You know, consultants uh, that, that understand shared values, attitudes, and beliefs. It also can help get the work done much quicker because you don't have to spend so much time building that lengthy relationship between an outside um, individual and someone that understands decision-making process in communities and um, how we live in our communities. I think it's just, just something that we want to keep in mind as we're doing this work. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. This brings us to standard 14, which is uh, which pertains to creating conflict and grievous, grievance resolution processes that are culturally and linguistically appropriate, which can help organizations facilitate open and transparent two-way communication and feedback mechanisms between individuals and organizations, as well as to help them anticipate, identify, and respond to cross-cultural needs. Uh, when I present this standard at, when I presented this standard in the past to other organizations, I always point out that it's very important to realize that just because you haven't received any conflict, if you, conflict or grievance uh, reports, that doesn't mean that there aren't concerns out in the community, because if your system isn't culturally and linguistically appropriate, then there isn't a way for your diverse community members to uh, to let you know that there are problems uh, if the system itself they can't they can't enter um, or they can't access. Uh, I think Esther uh, has some has an example about uh, the the difficulty in sometimes creating a conflict and grievance resolution process. Uh, yes, Darcy, thank you. Uh, I, for us, this has been the most difficult process uh, in the work that we're doing. And it's because our tribal members cannot identify, you know, what those conflicts are or how the, the you know, the, the processes that they're dealing with, they don't know how to convey it. And the, what has helped us is doing the Native American historical trauma education within the community for our providers, for our youth, and other groups uh, that provide services to the community. And uh, that, with that help and developing an understanding for oppression and conflicts within the tribal communities and even within organizations, 
that has brought us quite a bit of uh, clarity to understand the need of our tribal community. And therefore, you know, partnering with organizations such as universities or TA uh, technical assistance uh, projects out there, you know, we've really explored trauma-informed care. And looking through the lens of trauma, uh, trauma-informed uh, lenses, then we are able to see better uh, to plan for the needs of our tribal members within the community in the areas of health as well as other projects within San Felipe Pueblo. But I think that this type of work in order to move communities forward is really essential because so much has happened to our native people and, you know, having the people within the community having an understanding of what that is or what that looks like helps them deal with issues in a better way. And I'll give you an example. When we did this training for our tribal youth, I believe we trained 15 uh, teenage uh, youth. And um, we uh, had Dr. Maria Yellow Horse Braveheart do this training for us. And, and then we did the training with health and wellness staff a few days prior to the youth training. Um, we saw a different response from the youth in the way that they perceived the, the uh, training. And out of the youth response, we got an energy in that youth were really interested in substance abuse prevention, violence prevention, and they were really ready to step up to look at how they could help, you know, future generations and then, you know, partner with elders in looking at some of the issues um, from the elder perspective and then being a partner as a youth to move some of the programming forward. So I believe that, you know, looking at some of these considerations and looking at the conflicts that may not be spoken can be um, resolved by doing this, this type of education for um, tribal programs. Thank you, Darcy. Great, thank you, Esther. Um, and I think Gary has an excellent point to make in terms of making sure that there is a feeling of safety around these sorts of issues. Gary? Yeah, I, I think in communities it's important uh, that there is that sense of safety and also validation that people, um, if they bring a, a grievance or a concern up, that there is validation that um, they didn't do something wrong or that it's appropriate to do that because I, I see evaluation and these kinds of things only as a way to make something better and, and not something that's going to um, punish somebody. So <clears throat> keeping in mind that safety is an important factor in this as well. Great, thank you. Um, thanks to both of you for sharing those very important um, insights. And I think that, again, that's a, an excellent segue into the 15th and the last standard, which has to do with communicating the organization's progress regarding culturally, culturally and linguistically appropriate services to the community, um, which helps organizations convey information to intended audiences about its efforts and accomplishments in meeting the national class standards and help to build and sustain communication on class priorities and foster trust between the community and the service setting. Uh, again, if they know, if your constituents know that you're trying to reach them in the most responsive and respectful way possible and that conversation um, and those connections can be made and individuals can feel uh, safe and open and then there's trusted members who can help convey those messages. All of those things help uh, both the organization as well as the community. Uh, this uh, slide reflects um, the implementation document that we published um, almost a year ago. It's hard to believe that it'll be a year next month. But uh, this document, a blueprint for advancing and sustaining class policy and practice, which we commonly refer to as, as the blueprint, is a guidance document for the national class standards that discusses implementation strategies for each standard. So it walks, uh, 
it walks you through each individual standard. It kind of highlights some of the purpose of the standards, which I've touched on a little bit during the course of, of this presentation. But then it delves into what we mean when we're talking about those standards and kind of uh, provides some of the literature and some of the references and helps explain the individual, the nuances within each individual standard. It provides insight um, into some strategies for implementation and it also identifies some resources for, um, for implementation. Um, that said, uh, this, the blueprint also explains the case for class or, uh, you know, why is class such an, uh, there's, why is there a compelling need for class in the national class standards? What changed between the 2000 standards that I referenced earlier and the standards which were released again last year and the concepts found throughout the standards? So an in-depth discussion of culture and health and those sorts of pieces. In addition, it lists many resources found online for additional information and guidance. Um, the only caveat that I'll say is that we wrote this blueprint uh, with a broad audience in mind, understanding that what the national class standards will look like um, in a community-based organization in Des Moines or uh, in San Felipe Pueblo or a large hospital in Manhattan um, or a small clinic in uh, Oakland, the national class standards are going to look different on the ground, so to speak, in each of those venues. But we think that the strategies that we've uh, included in the blueprint will help uh, individuals and organizations uh, get an idea of how they can adopt and adapt the class standards to their organizations based on their mission, their size. Uh, the resources available and the populations that they're that they're trying to reach. Um, you can access the blueprint, uh, the national class standards, and more um, at the Think Cultural Health website. Think Cultural Health is a valuable resource for you as you continue to learn about and implement the national class standards. We're a trusted site for health and healthcare professionals to turn to for information and education related to class and health equity. Think Cultural Health houses the national class standards and the blueprint, which describes each standard and its purpose, as I said. Um, it also houses various resources relating to the national class standards, such as e-learning programs, a class clearinghouse, and as well as uh, all of the resources that are listed in the blueprint are available in the class clearinghouse, so you'll have quick and easy access to them. Uh, the web address for Think Cultural Health, in case there's anyone who's just on the audio portion of this webinar, is www.thinkculturalhealth.hhs.gov. Uh, we have a couple of questions. Um, do culturally and linguistically appropriate services apply to the LGBT community members in tribal communities as well? Um, absolutely. In, the, our, in our concept, and our definition of, of culture, we absolutely uh, include uh, the LGBT community. We include uh, sexual orientation, gender identity, uh, two-spirit, all of those, any individual um, with those Characteristics or 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 that uh, those identities are absolutely um, included and uh, and represented by by the national class standards. Um, I think uh, we have uh, Gary has another example of what the state of Montana has done um, to uh, talk about the integration of. Uh, culture and cultural competency into, into treatment. And then uh, after that, I think we'll be able to open it up for any additional uh, questions that our audience may have. Gary? Thank you. Uh, the state of Montana um, 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 chemical dependency treatment program approached, um, I think they approached this in, in a, a different manner. Uh, 
I think they realized that in the field of substance abuse, for example, American Indians um, going to a treatment facility might be re-traumatized when they're sent to this particular facility that might not be local, regional, or even provide historical or cultural understanding as to why maybe they self-medicated in the first place. Um, knowing that American Indians experience high rates of sexual abuse, neglect, trauma-related incidences, resulting in, you know, um, widespread impact and devastating effect on themselves and their families and communities, consuming um, a lot of health and human service dollars. Um, and what they did is they realized that American Indians who engage in substance abuse treatment don't typically sign on for the tacit Western cultural assimilation and struggle with that Western medicine model. And uh, the state was realized that the concept of health is understood differently. Um, the Western model perhaps repairs an individual. And a holistic Native American approach is about making the person better rather than just um, repairing them. So it was important that they did understand that health is understood differently. And um, what happened was a several-day cultural awareness and understanding provided by Native Americans to the directors and the treatment staff of the um, treatment center What's happened over the last couple of years as a result of that is individuals that are Native American going to a treatment center are feeling more welcome and safe and being allowed to, to smudge and um, continue practicing some of their ceremonies or even being reintroduced to some of these ceremonies that maybe they left because of uh, the behavior that they were doing, you know, in the past. So um, the Montana, I, I think, took a step ahead, and I think there's some great results. And um, if anyone is interested in some of those summaries or those outcome evaluations that, that came from the state of Montana, I'd be happy to share that. Great. Thank you so much, Gary. Uh, with that, uh, Sylvia, I think if we can open up the, the phone lines or offer to op up, open the phone lines if anyone has any, has any questions. Thank you. If you'd like to ask a question, press star 1 on your phone. And just remember to unmute your phone and record your name clearly before you ask your question. Okay. Well, if we don't have any additional questions at this time, which I'm guessing is the case, Sylvia? Yes, ma'am, we do not have any questions at this time. Okay. Um, well, I offer my email address if you have any questions um, that, that I can answer. Um, I don't know if uh, the other facilitators are able to, to share their emails as well or if you want to contact our, our hosts today, um, and they, I'm sure they can make sure that, that the questions get directed to the individuals who can be of assistance. Uh, there's a second email address up there, advancingclass at thinkculturalhealth.hhs.gov. And this is really for anything, questions about the standards, your, um, you know, stories on how you've begun to implement them at your organization, if you have any advice for us or for others who are working in the area of the national class standards, and the lessons that you've learned uh, as, you've, as you've implemented them. Um, and with that, uh, oh, and here are the, the are all of our email addresses. And with this, I'll turn it back over to uh, Connie uh, to to bring this webinar to a close. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Darcy. Um, I would love. I just wanted to love to say that I really appreciate this fantastic information that was shared by the three of you from our three presenters, Darcy Graves, Gary Newman, and Esther Tenario. Um, it was such a wonderful overview and provided some real practical information for how these standards are being implemented in our Native communities and even at the state level. And so I just want to thank you so much for being our presenters and also our guests today. 
If you do need uh, more information or um, want any contact information in addition to this contact information, just go ahead and email me, um, and I'll be happy to provide you with a copy of the PowerPoint and any other information. We're also recording this, so you'll be able to, um, you know, get a copy of the link and provide, you know, this will be available to you to use in your community as well. So I just want to thank everybody for joining us today. We look forward to um, having you on future webinars, and we again, we thank our wonderful presenters. Have a great day. This concludes today's conference. Participants may disconnect at this time.